Amen indeed. It's good to be in the Lord's house this morning. Glad that you're here with us. Know that we're all eagerly anticipating today's sermon. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 13. Yeah, we'll see how you're wooing at the end. <laughs> we're going to just dive right into it. Let's pray and ask the Lord to be with us today. Father, we love you and we thank you today for your word. God, we thank you for the gospel that is our salvation. And Father, there are so many hard things in your word. And what they point to is not your unreasonableness or your harshness, but what they point to is our sinfulness. And so, Father, we pray that you would be with us today as we read your word. We pray, God, that you would uh, magnify your own name, uh, God, and that you would show us who you'd have us to be in this world. We thank you, Lord, for your instruction. We thank you for the spirit that guides us by which we walk, Lord. And we just ask that you would um, prepare our hearts to hear your word today. We thank you and we love you in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, so last week, today we're going we're gonna to talk about serving God in a hostile world for the next few weeks, actually. And there's uh, several different um, particular circumstances that, G, uh, that uh, Peter is going to show us. Um, last week, we looked at verses 11 and 12, which are really the, the introduction of all that's going to come next in chapter 2 and into chapter 3. And so what I want to do first is I want to go back and read verses 11 and 12 just to kind of refresh that in your brain before we launch off into verse 13 through 17. Because verses 11 and 12, if you weren't here last week, I would encourage you to go back and listen to that on the website. They really inform what we're going to see in this text and then in the next two weeks as we talk about what it's like, what it looks like to live for Christ. Today, he's going to talk about what it looks like looks like to live uh, serving God for Christ in a hostile world, living under a worldly government. And, and so I know uh, that's the thing about expository preaching is we preach what comes next. If I had a choice, this probably wouldn't be my go-to passage, but this is God's word to us. This week, um, I told you last week, uh, someone said to me, well, you know, you, you really have a way of preaching that makes me not real, not feel real good, you know, and, and I told him what I said last week was, you know, well, you only got to hear it half an hour. I got to stew on it all week long. Well, I told y'all what I was going to be preaching last week. Somebody after the first service came. Well, now that you told me, I ended up having to stew on it all week long. Don't do that again. Don't tell me what's coming up. But I need you to understand that although it probably wouldn't be my go-to passage, this indeed is God's word and I'm not ashamed to preach it, not one little bit. So we're going to look at 1 Peter chapter 2, but let me read to you verses 11 and 12, what we did last week, just to refresh your, uh, refresh your memory about what we saw. He says, Beloved, I urge you as sojourners and exiles to abstain from the passions of the flesh, which wage war against your soul. And we took some time to describe in the context of what he's telling us in this section what those passions of the flesh are. We showed that they're mankind's passions without the Spirit, all of of us. Pride and, and, and self-centeredness and self-glory, self-honor. That's what he's going to talk about all through this chapter and all through the next chapter as well. And then he says, keeping your conduct among the Gentiles honorable so that, this is the reason we do it, when they speak against you as evildoers, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day of visitation. And so we looked at that last week, so I'm not going to re-preach those two verses, but that really informs what he's going to talk about in the next section, verses 11, uh, 13 through 17, which we're going to look at today. What he's doing is he's going to show us now in different situations what it looks like to abstain from the passions of the flesh. What it looks like in this situation, under government. What it looks like in next week will be under worldly authorities, under worldly masters. If you're a, a, a teacher, it'd be the principal. If you're a student, it'd be the teacher. Whatever, whatever authority you find yourself under, wherever you're at, he's talking about that situation. Then we'll talk about what it looks like in the home and then under suffering. He's going to show us in these specific situations what it looks like to abstain from the passions of the flesh and what it looks like to keep our conduct good before the nations, before the Gentiles, so that they will see our good conduct, our good works, and they will glorify God. And so today, as we look at how this looks, 
as we live under the government of our nation, worldly institutions, worldly leaders, um, you know, no one really especially looks forward to this text or this kind of sermon. And um, this week, as I'm studying and I'm preparing and I'm, you know, I would much rather come and, and thunder from this pulpit uh, the gospel of salvation, which I don't have a problem preaching the gospel from this text. It's God's word. And it's all about the gospel. But, you know, God and I just, you know, we had this. We, we, I say we had a little talk. I didn't hear no voice or anything. But basically, I'm whining all, all week long. But I don't. Why can't I do something else? Whose idea was it to pick First Peter anyway? You know, and, and finally, it was about Tuesday evening or Wednesday morning. It was like, I, I didn't hear no voice or anything, but it was like God telling me, he was saying, you know, if you don't want to preach my word, I sure can find something else for you to do. So I said, oh, okay, it's going to be fine. So we're going to preach it today and we're going to preach it boldly and, uh, because it is indeed God's word for us. It's God, God's word for us today. So I want to read the whole section and then we'll get into it. Verses 13 through 17 in 1 Peter chapter 2. He says this, Be subject for the Lord's sake. Submit yourselves, what it says. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. They were calling them evildoers, remember? Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. And then he summarizes everything he said in these four commands. Honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, and honor the emperor. Now, to be honest, um, when you read that, immediately questions come to mind. I mean, given the sinfulness of... So many of the world's governments and, and leaders, the, the worldliness that characterizes them all, the governments of this world, uh, the, given the values that they pursue, the, the ethics that they champion, it must be some kind of mistake here. This must be not what he means. Jason, tell us what he means. He means exactly what he said. How can those who serve the true king, who seek to obey the word of the true king and the will of the true king, submit to worldly leaders and rulers and laws that don't seek to obey the true king and the true word of God? You know, we have a hard time with that. And I understand. And it's compounded by the fact that we need to remember that although this is a word of God for you today, it's a word of God for you in Mulvane or South Central Kansas, it's also the word of God to the believers who live in Russia and the believers who live in China and those who live in Indonesia and those who live under Muslim countries, Muslim rule, those who live under harsh dictators. And to be honest, that makes it even seem more unreasonable, doesn't it? You might want to say, you might be tempted to say today that if Peter would have known how the world was going to turn out 2,000 years ago, he would have never written this. That assumes several wrong things. First of all, it was that the Holy Spirit didn't inspire Peter to write this, and he certainly did and did know what was going to be coming down the pipe 2,000 years from now and into eternity. But let me give you a little history lesson. Peter's writing from Rome. And... He's writing from the place where he would be executed for his faith. He's writing to churches in Asia Minor. Remember we talked about that in verse 1, chapter 1. Five areas of Asia Minor where these churches and these cities lived under the governance of Rome. And the Roman Empire of Peter's day, he wrote it around the mid-60s, uh, the government of, of Peter's day was the most corrupt and debased, morally wicked society ever known. I can tell you stories that would make your skin crawl advocating homosexuality as the norm in the Roman world. They advocated and legalized infanticide. If you had a baby that you didn't want, you just left it outside and it died of exposure. And that was perfectly normal, perfectly legal. In fact, the Christians in Rome and the surrounding areas became, uh, got a reputation for going around at night picking up all the babies and taking care of them and, and raising them as their own. This government was filled with corruption, harsh Harsh slavery laws, open abuse of women and children, 
immorality on a grand scale. Violence was rampant. It would defy your imagination if we just did a big history lesson on the Roman Empire in in Peter's day in the mid-60s. Plus, on top of all that, the emperor at the time that Peter writes is Nero. He is a complete and utter lunatic. Nero would murder anybody that he thought was any kind of threat to his power. He was probably the most debaucherous man that you could imagine. He would dress in animal skins and bite and claw prisoners and slaves to death. He killed his own mother, murdered his own mother, kicked his pregnant wife to death, and then castrated a young boy named Sporus and married him. I'm talking about nutball extraordinaire. Not to mention the fact that he led the charge of the first widespread persecution of Christians. This is the context that Peter's writing to these people under the governance of Roman Empire, specifically crazy, insane, wicked, evil Nero Caesar. So to be honest, we have it pretty good today. So let's look at this line by line, and I want you to see what he's telling us. And it's a hard lesson to learn. Make no mistake about it. And I'm not presenting it to you as someone who has done it all and has got it all going on. Last week we preached about pride and, and self and all those things and passions of the flesh. And when we, when we got home, Dana's cooking fish. She's frying fish and she started when we got home. So it, you know, it's taken a long time. And, and uh, me and Jesse and Ethan Tharp was there at our house and uh, she, we're walking through the kitchen going, man, when is it going to be done? When are we, are we hungry? What's, what's taking so long? And Dana said, okay, I got one batch ready. And I said, well, I've been out the longest. It's mine. I'm going first. <laughs> and Ethan Tharp said, okay, Pastor Jason. <laughs> so what are you even doing in my house, boy? Get out of here. <laughs> I had just preached a message on pride and self-centeredness. It's a, So I did what any good Christian would do. I went on and fixed my plate. (laughs) So don't think like I got it all going on. This is hard on me as it is on you. First thing we're going to look at is the duty of our submission. That's what it says. Be subject. Submit yourselves, technically is what it says, to every human institution, whether it be, and he specifically names the emperor. It, it, literally, it says king, but at this time, the king was the emperor. He says, whether it be the emperor as supreme or the governors that are sent by him, and this is their function, to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Those lesser magistrates. If you're uh, familiar with your Gospels and Acts, this would be people like Pilate. It would be people like Felix. It would be people like Festus that was given the uh, trying Paul for, for his preaching and for what he's done. This was hard for the first century readers to hear it as well. Be subject. Submit. For the Lord's sake, to every human institution, whether it be the emperor supreme or his lesser magistrates, to, to submit, to be subject, means to line yourself up under the authority. As a soldier would line himself or herself up under the commanding officer. It doesn't express defeat. It doesn't express weakness. Any more than the son submitting to the father expresses defeat or weakness or inferiority. Jesus submitted himself to the father's will. And so he says to us, be subject for the Lord's sake. He's not saying hang your head and be defeated. Hang your head and be weak. No, he's going to show us why in a minute because we're freed to do so. Now, Whenever you talk about this, immediately, immediately in your mind, I'm sure there's some that are in here thinking about it already, we understand that because we're submitting for the Lord's sake, that submission to the governing authorities, to the emperor as supreme or his governors, is not absolute. And we will talk about the limitations in a moment. But don't run off to find an exception because you don't like the rule. Okay? Let's not, let's not run off to make sure we got all the limitations down in our minds so we know when we can break the rule. Let's let this command do its work in our heart. Let, it, let our calling inform our actions and, and rub up against our pride a little bit, mine included. 
This is God's word. This is inspired by the Spirit of God for all His people for all time. Be subject. It means to honor and obey the authority that we've been placed under of governments, of governors, of rulers, of magistrates, civil government. And notice the reason. It's for the Lord's sake. It's not because of how good they are, how good the governor is, or how good the magistrate is, or how good the the president is, or the king, or the emperor is. We know Nero wasn't good at all. It's not because of him, whether he's good or bad or, 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 or whoever. It's not You don't submit yourself to police officers when they give you commands because they're good ones or bad ones. All you know is they bear authority and so for the Lord's sake we submit ourselves we honor and submit to authority because we follow a higher king because we honor a greater ruler we submit because our God is sovereign over all things Do you really believe that today that our God is sovereign that he is sovereign over all things over all things really That means that He's sovereign over who is in authority. They're there because He wills it or allows it. We're told so specifically in Romans chapter 13. Paul says, let every person, and Nero was the emperor when Paul wrote Romans as well. Let every person be subject to the governing authorities for there is no authority except from God. And those that exist have been instituted by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authorities resists what God has appointed. And those who resist will incur judgment. Man, that's that's real. He goes on to say, For rulers are not a terror to good conduct. That's what we've been talking about, good conduct, but to bad. Would you have no fear of the one who is in authority? Then do what's good, and you will receive his approval, for he he is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is the servant of God, an avenger who carries out God's wrath on the wrongdoer. Do you know who you're talking about here, Paul? Paul would say, yeah. It's, it's going to be the guy that executes him. Jesus said the same thing to Pilate. Remember when we were walking through John and he's before Pilate? Jesus answered to Pilate. Pilate says, don't you know I have the power to release you? Jesus said, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. So regardless of the worthiness or the lack thereof of governors or governments or rulers, they serve a purpose of God. Peter says this in this text that we're looking at. He says that they exist to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. Now, granted, there are times when they don't do that, when they don't do right, when they don't fulfill their obligation to God. But nevertheless, they exist for a purpose. So here is the call. Our duty, our call, is to subject ourselves to obey. Not because they're worthy or they deserve it, but because we bow to God's authority. We're called to be good citizens of the nation in which we live, that's if that, I would preach the same thing to those who are in China or Indonesia or any of those things. We're called to be good citizens in order to fulfill the responsibility we have to God. Neither Jesus nor the apostles ever led a rebellion, never denied the authority of the Sanhedrin, which was the ruling council there in Jerusalem, or Rome. They submitted when they were unjustly beaten. They submitted when they were illegally jailed. They never resisted arrest. Before we go on, and we will talk about the limitation, let that sink in for a minute. That is a call from our God. That is a responsibility that we have to Him. And we'll talk about why extensively in just a minute. But first, let that, let that marinate a little bit. Let it rub up against our pride. We need to feel it cut against the grain. Many of us, including myself, have let these words come out of our mouth. Nobody's going to tell me what i got to do. Oh, Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, they will. We must learn in the... Remember, 13 and 14 are right after 11 and 12. We must learn to abstain from the passions of the flesh. 
pride and self-glory and self-honor. Do you feel that? It don't feel good, does it? If it don't feel good, that means you're understanding this text rightly. Now, who sure is quiet in here. <laughs> Duh. Don't be flattening my tires when I leave here. Now, since we are to subject ourselves specifically for the Lord's sake, because He is our King, He is our Sovereign, by definition, there are limits. By definition, our obedience to civil government and magistrates and those kind of things is not absolute. Even Peter would tell you that obedience to authority is not absolute. In Acts chapter 4, Peter is arrested for preaching. And he is beaten. And he's brought before the Sanhedrin and he's told never to preach in the name of Jesus again. And his response in Acts chapter 4, verse 19, it says, whether it is right in the sight of God to listen to you rather, or listen to you rather than to God, you must judge, for we cannot speak of what we, we cannot but speak of what we have seen and heard. He basically tells them, I don't care what you say. You figure out if it's right or wrong. We're going to keep on doing it. And then the next day, in Acts chapter 5, he's arrested again for preaching. And he stands before them with the apostles and says, We must obey God rather than men. So the principle is clear. We submit to the authorities that be. We submit to the rulers, to the emperor as supreme, or the governors that he is, has sent in his name. Until submitting to them means disobeying God. When, when submitting to the authority means we have to violate a biblical command or a principle, not only should we not submit, we cannot, we must not submit. There are many examples in the Bible of people who obeyed God rather than man and are commended for doing so. In Exodus chapter 1, you know the story when the Pharaoh uh, was... was you know, he decreed that all the babies would be killed. The, the Hebrew midwives wouldn't do it. They started hiding the babies. They defied his order. In Daniel chapter 3, uh, you see the three Hebrew boys, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. When Nebuchadnezzar said, everybody has to bow down to this statue, they said, we're not doing it. And they accepted their punishment. They got thrown in the fire and God saved them from the fire. In Daniel chapter 6, King Darius gave a decree that no one could pray to their God. They have to pray to him for the next whatever amount of time it was. And he signed the decree. And in Daniel chapter 6 verse 10, I put it on here so you could read it. He says, when Daniel knew that the document had been signed. It, Daniel didn't do it out of ignorance. He knew when the document had been signed. He went to his house where he had windows in his upper chamber open toward Jerusalem. He got down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God as he had done previously. He defied the order of King Darius. Now, I put this verse on the screen and didn't explain it to you like I did the others, but I wanted you to see it because I'm convinced that today, if this were to happen today, there would be lots and lots of people that say, well, Daniel shouldn't have done that. He didn't have to open his windows he could have prayed in private just like everybody else does. He didn't have to make a big show. But God didn't. God commended him for it. God saved him out of the lion's mouth because of it. He's commended for obeying God rather than man. So the rule is simple. We submit. We obey the government. We obey the rulers. We obey the lesser magistrates. We obey the ruling authorities of our nation. We live as good citizens. But when we're faced with a law that forces us to disobey God's command, we submit to God, not to man. So immediately the question becomes, when, that, when you're faced with that, the question that you need to ask yourself is this. Here's a law that I'm supposed to follow. Here's an order from a magistrate that I'm supposed to follow. The question becomes, can I comply with this law in a way that is faithful to God's commands? If the answer to that question is yes, then you need to submit yourself. If the answer to that question is no, then you need to obey God rather than man. Got it? Now, immediately there's another question that comes to mind. Immediately I've got a lot of questions. 
What if it's not such a black and white deal? What if it's a little gray area around there? So in Rome, Caesar, by, by this time, Caesar was law. You know, it was a republic in name only. The Senate really was just a rubber stamp by the time Nero was Caesar. So his word goes. You know, he makes law. He's above the law. He makes law by decree. If you don't like it, you die. And many Christians did. You know, and if that's what it costs, then that's what you pay. And they went to their death willingly. We obey God rather than man. But today, especially in our context, we live under a government in America where no ruler is above the law. The law of our nation is the Constitution. And in 1803, there was a court case called Marbury versus Madison that established the principle of judicial review, meaning if there's a law passed that's unjust, that's unconstitutional, or an order that's passed that's unconstitutional, we have the right as citizens to appeal that law, to appeal that law through the court system. It's possible then today that an illegal law gets passed or an unjust law gets handed down. That's not necessarily against God's word, but... Neither is it just or right. What do we do then? As citizens, we have the right to appeal. Paul never resisted arrest, ever. He never fought with the authorities. But he did assert his rights as a Roman citizen many times. In Acts chapter 16, you know the story where he's in prison with Silas. He didn't fight against them. He went willingly. He was imprisoned. And what did they do? They sang in the jailhouse. And the jail was shaken all the doors opened up and the jailer ended up getting converted. And the next morning, the magistrates who had put Paul in jail came and ordered him released. They didn't want to have to deal with it. And Paul says in chapter, Acts chapter 16, verse 37, he says, when Paul, but Paul said to them, they have beaten us publicly, uncondemned, men who are Roman citizens and have thrown us into prison. And do they now throw us out secretly? No, let them come themselves and take us out. The police reported these words back to the magistrates and they were afraid when they heard that they were Roman citizens. They were asserting their rights as Roman citizens. No, no, you've made a bad mistake right here. You're going to have to come out with your own hands and release us and tell, tell, let everybody know you were wrong. In Acts chapter 22, Paul is preaching before Jerusalem and the crowd reacts violently to him. And so he, the Romans take him into custody and he's about to be beaten just because they think he started the riot. And they've got him laid out. He says the tribunes, the tribune ordered him to be brought into the barracks saying that he should be examined by flogging. They were about to beat him to find out why they were shouting against him like this. Why was the crowd so upset? But when they had stretched him out, Paul is ready to be beaten. When they'd stretched him out for the whips, Paul said to the centurion who was standing by, Is it lawful for you to flog a man who's a Roman citizen and uncondemned? He knew good and well it wasn't lawful. In fact, you beat an uncondemned, untried Roman citizen and... And so when the centurion heard this, he went to the tribune and said, well, What are you about to do? This man's a Roman citizen. Paul asserted his rights as a Roman citizen. Acts chapter 25, same thing. He is standing before Festus and it's clear he's not going to get a fair trial. If they send him back to Jerusalem, he's going to die. They're going to kill him. And so Paul knew that every Roman had the right to appeal to Caesar. And when you appeal to Caesar, all trials stop. All accusations stop. All punishment stops. And that Roman citizen is sent to Rome to stand trial before Caesar. And Paul does that. He appeals to Caesar. And at that moment, everything stops and they take him to Rome. He asserted his rights as a Roman citizen. So we have a biblical precedent to appeal laws, to fight for our rights as a citizen. The question you have to ask yourself today, though, is what, what is going to glorify God more in whatever situation I find myself? There were times when Paul just submitted to unjust laws, took his punishment, and went on. And there were times when Paul asserted his rights as a Roman citizen. How do you know when to and when not to if it's kind of a gray area? It's not a, not a matter of, you know, this definitely violates a biblical command, therefore I can't do it. I think the answer to that is what we're going to find in the rest of Peter's instruction, verse 15 and 16, is what's your motive? What's your motive? 
So when we look at the motive for submitting, he says, be subject to the emperors and the governor, governing uh, people that he sends in his name to punish the, the, the evildoers and reward the, the good people. I, I'm doing it from memory. He says, for this is the will of God, that by doing good, you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. In verse 13, he told us, be subject for the Lord's sake. And now he's explaining what that means. For his sake means for his glory, for his name. And he kind of repeats what he said in verse 12. Remember in verse 12, he says, when they call you evildoers, they will see your good deeds and they will glorify God. He says, this is the will of God. This is how you silence those accusations by doing good. And you can't just put whatever you want to in doing good. You can't say, well, I do this and I do this and I do... No, the context is talking about submitting yourself to the authorities. And so he says, by doing good, by doing this, by submitting yourself, you put to silence the ignorant, the ignorance of foolish people who say that you're a, a, a rebel or an insurrectionist or, or whatever they were saying. When they call you evildoers, they'll see your good deeds and glorify God. When you do this, when you submit to the governing authority, you, you show yourself a good citizen, one who respects the law, respects authority. You silence those who slander you, call you evildoers. Their accusations are just seen as ignorance. This is God's will for silencing accusations. His point, I think, is to tell us to remember why you are here. We're here to further the mission of Christ. We're here to glorify God in what He's called us to do. When we're slandered and accused, we further the gospel of the kingdom not by attacking back, but by living lives of virtue and honor before the world. Then he says something in verse 16 that don't even seem like it fits. He says, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Live as people who are free, living as servants of God. How can you have both? Are we free or are we not free? Live as people who are free, but he also says living as servants. The word servant and slave are the same word, depending on what context is being used. Live as people who are free, but slaves to God. But living as slaves to God. He says, live as people who are free because you are free. You're no longer bound by man's law. You're no longer bound by what man says because you are bound to a higher authority. Now, you are adopted sons and daughters of God, the King of kings, the ruler of all creation, sovereign over all, king over all. He is our supreme allegiance, and we are His servants before anything else. But God has sent us back into this world as His servants, which we are. He sent us back into the systems of men, back under the authority of mankind in order that we would be ambassadors for His kingdom. We're foreigners and exiles. Remember what Peter called us? We're foreigners, but we are foreign delegates now. That is why we submit for the Lord's sake. For His name. We are here in His name. We're here for His glory. We are free and don't owe man anything because of who man is. We don't owe the emperor or the governors that he sends uh, our obedience because of their worth or their power or because we're afraid of them. We owe them submission only because we are servants of the living God and He calls us to do so. And He calls us to do so in order that we would proclaim Him. That we would show Him. This is our motive. This is why we do what we do. We're, we are subject, we subject ourselves, not just in order to be good people or to keep everything in line, but because we have a mission. We are sent under the authority of whatever country we're in, whatever place we're in, to proclaim Jesus. A good example of what it means to be free, free from authority, but sent back under authority, is Jesus in Matthew chapter 17. In Matthew chapter 17, 
It says, when they came to Capernaum, the collectors of the two drachma tax went up to Peter and said, does your teacher not pay tax? He said, yes. And when he came into the house, Jesus spoke to him first saying, what do you think, Simon? From whom do the kings of the earth take toll or tax? From their sons or from others? Pretty simple question. You and I know it today. Do the leaders, does a king tax his own son or does he tax all them other people? You know good as well as I do that he tax all them other people. He don't tax his own son. And so Jesus spells this out to Peter, and then it says, When Peter said, from others, which is the logical answer, Jesus said to him, then the sons are free. He's saying to him, we are sons of the living God. We're sons of the sovereign of all the universe. We're free. But then in verse 27, he says, However, not to give offense to them, go to the sea and cast a hook and take the first fish that comes up. And when you open its mouth, you'll find a shekel. Take that and give it to them for me and for yourself. Free, but placed under subjection because you have a mission to complete. Our motive to submit, church, is not because we are defeated or because we are powerless or because we are afraid. We will never be defeated. The gates of hell won't prevail against the church. It's not because we're infatuated with leaders or afraid of our rulers. We submit and live as good citizens because we are servants of God here. We show His glory here. That's why it says in Peter, don't use your freedom as a cover-up for evil. When we disobey, when it's necessary to disobey, it should be clear that why we are doing so is because we are Christians. Because we will not violate God's commands. Because we will serve Jesus Christ above all. And when we disobey, we must be willing to take the consequences. This text admonishes us. Check your heart. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil. Check your heart. Why is it that you will not submit? Especially when it's a gray area. When it's not a gray area, the choice is made for you. You obey God rather than men. But when it's a gray area, and technically you probably could obey if uh, you know God doesn't say, don't do this, but... Why is it? Are you, are you not submitting for the gospel's sake? For the Lord's sake? For His name? Because of His word? Or is it because it just hurts your pride? Because that don't glorify self as much as I need to glorify self. Then I go tell me what to do. Because it stings my honor. These things that we're talking about here, my pride, my glory, my self, my honor are the things three verses ago he called passions of the flesh, which we are to abstain from. So he says here, examine your heart. Don't cry freedom as a means of covering up your own sinful heart, my own sinful heart, my own rebellion, my own evil. Our motive must be servants of God. I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example about me. That way you feel a little better. I was talking to somebody last week about this text and about what it means. And I don't know, I guess... Well, I'll give you the short version. It's almost time to go. So anyway, I'm, I'm saying, so understand, this, this, this. And I know that this person I'm talking to, they're guilty of this, this, and this. And so I'm like, I'm, I'm being kind, though. I'm, I'm a pastor. I know, how to, I know how to get around all that. And so that person said to me, so it's, it's kind of like... Speeding, isn't it? What y'all all? Oh, wait a minute. Yeah. Yeah, my good buddy let all y'all know when I let him use the pulpit one Sunday. How... Amen. <laughs> if y'all want to talk about him, come see me. I got a list. Yeah, it's exactly like that. I have, me and speed limits have a love hate relationship. And you know what that's called? Sin. That's what it's called. And the last two weeks, as God has convicted me of it, guess what Jason's been doing? He's been driving a speed limit. And that's hard for me. Because y'all ain't got no trees around here. (laughs) 
in Tennessee, it seems like you're going faster because them trees are zipping by you. Out here, it's like the horizon don't move. I'm not moving. <laughs> but I say that not to make light of it because it's sin. It is sin. I could do that, I guess. <laughs> Understand, we don't examine our heart and cry, well, I'm free to do whatever, simply because we want to protect our own pride. Last thing he says, I've got to hurry up, I'm almost done. Last verse, verse 17. He gives a summary. More often than not, when we understand the pride of our own heart, it means we humble ourselves. What Jesus said, you want to be my disciple, you deny yourself. And you take up your cross and you follow me. And so Peter gives this summary. At the end, he shows us what it all looks like. How do I put it into practice? What do I need to do? What do I owe? That's really the question. Jesus said, give to Caesar what's Caesar's and to God what's God's. So what is it that I owe? He says, first, to honor everyone. All mankind made in the image of God. Male, female, no matter what color, no matter what nationality, boy, girl, doesn't matter. If you are a human being, you are made in the image of God and you're worthy of honor because of that. Now, how we honor each individual might be different. You'll honor your father and your mother differently than you'll honor your wife or your husband. You'll honor your wife or your husband differently than you'll honor your children. You'll honor your children differently than you'll honor somebody else's children. You'll honor people differently, but every person is worthy of honor. Regardless of, of who they are, they're entitled because of they're made in the image of God. Second thing he says is love the brotherhood. He's talking about God's people. He's talking about the church. Love the church. And he's referring here, church, to those who live among one another. Remember, he's talking to churches in the areas of Asia Minor. He's not saying to them, oh, you know, some mystical idea of love, that we love the whole church all around the world, that we're never going to see, never going to meet, never going to... I mean, we do love them because they are the church, but he's specifically telling these believers in these places, this is how you live. When he says, love the brotherhood, he's, he's talking about spending your lives on one another, helping one another. It goes beyond honor. It speaks of affection and commitment. The body is given to one another, the bride of Christ, especially during times of persecution and trials. This is the command. No command is more often repeated in the New Testament than this one. Love one another, brothers and sisters. Actively depend on one another. Bear one another's burden. I, I could go on. I could give you a list of, uh, of bunches of them. No command is more often repeated then this one. Be invested in one another's lives. You're going to need one another. Then he says, fear God. We saw the fear of the Lord in chapter 1. We went through it. He gives us the highest authority that we are to follow. The highest honor is to be given to God and God alone. The highest obligation we have is to follow Him. He is the highest master. His law, His command supersedes all others. It doesn't say fear the emperor here. It says fear God alone, but then it says honor the emperor, the king specifically. Now Peter said honor everyone. Why does he repeat himself? Say honor. You already said honor everyone. Doesn't, isn't the emperor covered in that? He means honor Him in regard to His authority. Because God is in control. It's not because of who He is. I already told you, Nero is a nutball. Because we're sent into this world under the authority structures of mankind to be lights for Jesus. Because we are His ambassadors. And everything we do when we submit, when we disobey because of God's Word, should glorify God. We dwell in a foreign land and we are emissaries of Christ in a foreign land. This is our mission. This is His mission for us. And we must represent our God with the honor that He deserves. And the only way that's possible, church, is first we have to give up our own kingship. We have to give up our own life. The only way to come, become His ambassador, which means being freed from sin, being freed from death, being born again, is to trust in Jesus and surrender your life to Him. Have you done that this morning? Will you do that this morning? 
That's a hard text to have to hear, I know. It's a harder text to preach. If you say, I'm not doing it, I don't care. The question has to be, why? Is it because you haven't yet submitted yourself to Jesus? You haven't yet given Him your heart and life? If that's true in your life, then you've got a lot bigger problems than the government or the rulers. Give your heart and life to Christ today. And then as a church, as believers, let's get on mission for Christ and glorify His name. Father, we love you. We thank you today for your word. God, as difficult as it is to hear truths from your word that sting, even in my own heart, in my own life, God, so many areas where I fail you in this. Lord, we pray that you would forgive us our sin, wash us in the blood of Christ that you sealed us in. We pray and thank you for the gospel that gives us forgiveness and justifies us, makes us righteous before you. And today, most importantly of all, I pray that if there's anyone here that has not surrendered their life to you in faith, turning their life over to you, trusting that you paid for their penalty on the cross of Calvary. Father, I pray that you would speak to their heart. I pray that you would help us to fight to abstain from the passions of the flesh because they indeed war against our soul and we can feel that war brewing inside of us. God, we pray that you would give us that you would give us wisdom to walk in the spirit. Let us walk in the spirit according to your word and God help us to be instruments used by you to share this gospel to the world. We love you and we thank you in Jesus name. Amen. I'm going to stand down here as I always do. If you want to come and trust in Christ, give your life to Him, whatever you come. Will you stand with me?